Yeah. So, uh, congratulations you. on this uh, nice occasion. Uh, I'm a little bit behind you. Uh, so, <laughs> I want just to. Just let us know the date. What? <laughs> I said, just let us know the date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we've known each other for, for many years. Uh, uh, I wait to remember some episodes. Uh, maybe you know where, what I'm talking about now. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. in Mastland, yeah. So, there yeah. were the uh, Chalmers yeah. people that were okay. kind enough to organize a lot of, uh, a lot of nice meetings there. Maybe, I'm sure many of us were there. Um, and I remember also that you talked about concurrent constraint programming there, right? And all, you had all these followers that were sitting listening to your wise words. Uh, I was working on probabilistic process algebra, uh, actually, at that time. Uh, and we spoke mostly about soccer, actually. And we played soccer and that was... Uh, that was uh, I actually scored a goal. And you even scored a goal. Yeah. And, and you managed to injure, injure uh, your Kim Paris. That was, uh, that was a full success. Uh, then we move a little bit forward because I think you were actually visiting Brix uh, during '97. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it was Brix in August, not in August. So, uh, so we really didn't have a chance to meet. Uh, you were now working on labeled market processes, and I was completely uh, swamped in with, uh, with this tool, you call. Uh, <clears throat> but I think actually our tool has a lot to nowadays. <coughs> we'll see that actually a lot of, of things to, uh, to take from this uh, continuous space extension. Probabilistic bison weight because we're actually looking at not just time photometer, which is the formless in the new problem, but stochastic time photometer. So we will need all the advice from uh, these labeled macro processes. Uh, now, I think actually we're doing some serious work together. <laughs> so you see these two small twins there on this enormously large uh, 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 chair there uh, in Norbock. Uh, so this is Adam and uh, Prakash uh, working hard on uh, metrics and, uh, and probabilistic bison weight and dualities and what have you. So, of course, I hope this will continue very much in the future and you will come back and visit us there. So. Uh, <coughs> it would be very nice. Back to the title. So, probabilistic bison relation model checking, uh, uh, you know, it's been existing for many years, and these are things where things are either equivalent or where your system satisfies the property. And what I think is a sort of commonality between the distances and the statistical approach is that now you want to weaken these statements. So, your things are not equivalent, but there are some distance apart. And when you do statistical model chain, if you know what that is, and if you don't, you can see a little bit about it in the talk, uh, you try to settle uh, 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 whether a property holds with a certain confidence. So whatever, whatever claim you make, it comes with the confidence. It might be that you have a certain small probability of actually making a false statement there. I'm still not quite sure what is the relationship here, but I, I, I hope to, maybe with you, to, to maybe look, look more into that. So uh, the setting here is that of uh, on market chains. Uh, so you have states, you have labels, you have uh, prob uh, transition probability functions. There's a very nice such <coughs> market chain here, finite state market chain. You have a labeling function giving a label for each state here. So you have the, the pink and the blue and the green here. So that's nice. Uh, and that was actually the setting that Anna and I uh, looked at. Well, not quite. We were actually looking at reactive system, but never mind that. Uh, when we introduce this notion of probabilistic bisimulation, because we really think that we should be able to equate this, this state as, as one, <coughs> and this state as two. Why? Well, because we can find an equivalence relation over these states, so that S1 and S2 have the same labeling, and for any equivalence class, they actually agree on the total probability of reaching that class. So if you take that particular class down here, they agree on the probability of two-thirds of reaching that class. Uh, so that was quite nice. Uh, later on, people looked at uh, Crystal Bayer also worked in this area here. Also, I think with you um, at some point. You never worked with Crystal Bayer? She was, she, was, she, was, she, was, she was one of your followers. She was always sitting there. I don't know. Maybe that was something different. I don't know. Wow. Sorry. Let's carry on. But anyway, anyway, you know, my simulation, not my simulation, which I'm trying to decide both. And she had. Very nice uh, way of proving that this notion of probabilistic bisimulation is also from the time aside. And it's a congruence, so you have all the nice uh, properties. It has also a, a logical characterization, so if you take ordinary and small logic or more logic with, and replace the two with universal and existential next modalities, you can just uh, plug in, you can replace them with this one single uh, probabilistic modality where you have a threshold probability on the total probability of a state reaching a state satisfying F. So for instance, S1 and S2 agree that with at least probability 0 0.5, they will reach a blue state. So 
Uh, and what was nice about this logic is that it modulo some image finiteness conditions. Uh, it completely characterizes probabilistic price inversion. So that was sort of uh, what I did with Arne. And then this book came along, right? So I remember you were talking about these continuous space uh, Markov, uh, or labeled Markov processes with points moving around in weird, in weird ways. And I thought it was a little bit uh, eccentric, actually. But now, I, now the book is here. So I, I actually, uh, I can... I can see that this is really what we need. So now you have um, an infinite set of states, most likely, and uh, you have um, the sigma, <coughs> or sigma field over S, and this uh, next state probability function is replaced by um, a function assigning the probability to go from a state to one of these measurable sets. Uh, and what is also, not my, I think this was not your original formulation of this probabilistic bisimulation in this setting, but I think this is nice because for me it, it resembles what I know and love. So again, it's an equivalence relation, a probabilistic bisimulation is an equivalence relation, so that uh, S and S prime in that relation agree on the probability of reaching certain sets. What are these sets? They're actually measurable unions of these equivalence classes. So that's what a probabilistic uh, bisimulation is. Uh, and what shocked me actually was that you could do without negation uh, in, 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 in the, the logic that characterized this. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think you were using some remarkable facts from analytical spaces to actually uh, try to. Uh, and I mean, very much due to you, uh, Ardu and Dexter, I mean, there is this nice lifting or generalization of this to, to a stone duality between uh, an algebraic and analog to this on algebras and, and uh, certain kinds of. Uh, continuous space uh, uh, processes. So that's that's very beautiful. And now to time the Thomas. So maybe you, so this is where I need your help. So uh, in, in one little slide, this is what time the are. So just look up here. So um, it's a finite state. It's in the back one, you have a finite state automator, but you have these clocks here. Right? And the idea is that when you're in a state, the value of this, these clocks will evolve. So when you start here, X, the value of x will be zero, then time evolves, and uh, then you have constraint on the value of that clock which will enable or enforce taking of these transitions. So just shortly saying, you actually will need to go from here to here between four and, and, and eight time events. So that's actually a time determinator drawn in the Euclid tool. Uh, here's another time determinator. Uh, here is the first step which needs to be taken between two and four, and then non deterministic you have to go up there and there, and then there's a second step between two and four. And here you have another one, almost similar to that, except that you don't have the non deterministic choice. So are they by similar? And in fact, they are. Sorry. Uh, they are by similar, and they completely agree on, <coughs> on the uh, minimum and maximum time for actually going from the start state to the end state. That you can prove. There, is, there are notions of time by similarity, which actually uh, Kali Sherens from Latvia showed in 92 was decided well, much to the shock of people from, uh, from the US. So, so, so you can actually decide time extensions of similarity. But now what we are doing is that we are actually looking at stochastic extensions of this formalism. So this choice of these delays will be drawn from some distribution, let's say a uniform distribution. These discrete choices here will be drawn from some discrete probability distribution. Uh, and uh, similar uniform down here. And now you can of course talk about the expected time to go from this last state to the other distribution. And now you can see that there are actually these two still look similar, right? but this one with the uniform step here is, is, is definitely. And these are these are plots obtained simply by simulation of these systems. But I think you can actually understand these as, as labeled Markov processes uh, in, if you do it in a suitable, what, suitable way, and we should be able to benefit from uh, from the notion of of by simulation there to to, to really understand to say see that these two guys are actually probabilistic by similar, whereas this guy is not. <coughs> Uh, okay, back to uh, finite state markup chains and probabilistic by simulation and the idea of distances. So what I'm doing here is that I'm saying what would now happen if, for whatever reason, that uh, S1 and S2 didn't quite agree on this uh, one-third probability of going to S3, but there is a small de epsilon deviation. So I think Frank in this talk yesterday must have uh, informed you a lot about that. So all kinds of good reasons for that. Maybe this is the ideal model and you were doing some learning and this is what you ended up with. Um, and uh, still you would like to say that maybe in certain uh, application scenarios 
it's just as good to work with S1 as S2. You will never be able to, uh, in a significant way, to see the difference between these two things. So uh, this is simply too fragile. And I think uh, one of the so equivalents that are too fragile. So what we want is we want to replace the notion of equivalence with the notion of distance. We want to say something about what could then be the behavioral distance between S1 and S2, given this syntactic modifications of these probabilities. Uh, so you want to replace equivalences with um, pseudometrics. So the usual actions for an equivalence relation should be replaced with, by these actions for a pseudometric. So transitivity in particular should be triangular in quality. And you would like to capture probabilistic bisimilarity in the sense that things are at distance zero precisely when they're probabilistic bisimilar. Right? So there were some initial suggestions in, 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 in this. Maybe you can think that it's strange that this is actually dated before our, our probabilistic uh, isolation paper. In fact, it isn't. I mean, this was the German version I was referring to. There, so. so they actually were looking quite a bit on that. Uh, Jack Alone, Joe, and, and Small Cap. Uh, but I think they, they didn't quite get it right. Uh, the, the first, in my mind, the first real authentic uh, bisimulation pseudometric was actually due to you and Jose and Vinet and Rada, yeah? where you, I think, much inspired by PPDL, by, by Dexter, you had this real value of logic uh, where now the distance between two systems were the variational distance of the val of, of, of overall expressions of formulas in this real value logic, the difference between the value of these functions of, the, of these two states, S and S1. Uh, so that's very nice, and actually if you apply this to this our little system here, uh, you will actually be able to figure out that the distance between these two states, well, for, for whatever reason, the behavioral distance is actually this epsilon, which was the parameter. So that's, that's beautiful, and I'm sure that um, a little bit later, there was a fixed point characterization by, by James and, and Frank, and I, I'm sure you must have explained this quite a bit yesterday. So, and at least in my mind, this is where this was first uh, published. Um, so the idea is that um, in order to capture this, in, and I would, say, I would say this is a logical definition of the, of the distance point. Uh, now, the behavioral definition of the distance would be is using notions of matching, so you have the the probability transition function out of S here, and the probabilities of going the next state probability distribution out of T here, and somehow you want to redistribute these probabilities using matchings. In fact, this notion of matching B was already something I used with Ben Johnson in a paper in 91, uh, where we had an alternative definition of a probabilistic bisimulation, and there the matching was, was such that you only needed to have non-zero probability flowing between probabilistic bisimulation states then that would be another way of characterizing that. But now if things are not probabilistic by similar, you would, by, you would necessarily have to sort of <coughs> have some non-zero probability relating non by similar states. And let's say that you already know that they're at some distance. So what do you want to do? Well, of course you want to, to find the optimal matching. Out of all these matchings, you would like to find the one where this weighted uh, distance, giving known distance between these successive states, is as small as possible. So this is actually this Kantorovich, uh, I would say, um, yeah, distance between these two distributions here, that I'm, or the Kantorovich lifting of these two, of these distance between the successive states here. And now if you take essentially the fixed point of that uh, <coughs> functional here, well, weaving into the picture, that of course you also need to, to care about the distance in the labeling between S and, and T here, then uh, you get, you can say, the Kantorovich distance between so uh, that's very nice, um, and I think what is beautiful is that they actually agree. Right? So, so this uh, logical characterization of the distance and the fixed point characterization of the distance <coughs> are in complete um, agreement. Uh, and what we learned more recently was that actually there are a, a line of very recent results. So it's not just ancient stuff here that's actually very active right now. Is that even Similar to probabilistic bisimulation, we have to compute this probabilistic distance in polynomial time. So this was in this uh, work here from Fossax by Ben and Frank, and uh, I don't know what the D is for. D is for D. D is for what? D is for D. D is for D? Yeah, D-I. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Very, very, very nice, very nice result. And uh, in fact, we were 
very much inspired by it. Uh, so we actually, uh, Badu and uh, Baki and Baki, Giovanni and, and Giorgio, actually went away and um, did uh, an implementation of an on-the-fly algorithm for computing exactly this distance here. So there is an implementation you can use for doing computing distances. Uh, I would also say there is an Im interesting result in this uh, recent paper, it's hard to see here, uh, by Tao Lu Chen and Stephen Kiefer uh, on this um, sort of um, on the complexity of this variational distance. So if you now take the probability that S and S prime that, uh, satisfies LTL formulas, so if you do that and you look at the variational distance based on that, that's actually shown in this paper and independently by us in this. Uh, Paper, it's still unpublished paper here, shown to be NP hard. It's still, it's still not known whether it's decidable, so, so this is really a hard problem. But what is known is that this polynomial time decidable distance is actually another one. So if you really want to sort of say something about, <coughs> well, there is, these things are quite close in terms of satisfying the, the distance and satisfying the LTL formulas, you could use this uh, Kantorovich distance, um, probabilistic isolation distance, as a, as a good as a good one. Yeah, and there are recent work by Pietro and Saginho and uh, David Kepler and, uh, and uh, David Lee on actually having rule formats for probabilistic systems where you have guarantees of things being compositional in terms of operators being contracting or non expanding or continuous uh, with respect to this metric. So, so this is a, a lot of, I would say, quite, uh, quite recent work. And uh, I think this is, this is nice. <laughs> this is nice, and we should, of course. Uh, continue this, and as you will see a little bit later on, I think there is some good reasons for actually not stopping here. Uh, let me say something about statistical model checking. Uh, <clears throat> so this is something that in the model checking community is uh, um, started maybe some six, seven years ago by Jonas uh, from CMU, 2005, in his thesis. So it's about having stochastic models, markup chains, continuous time markup chains, stochastic time determiner, and then by simulation, settling whether in, tip, in, in particular uh, um, linear time uh, properties uh, are satisfied. On that. So we actually implemented the full, the full range of such statistical model chain capabilities and you can see here from a number of examples that we have actually been successfully dealing with. So analyzing a, a lot of uh, wireless communication protocols, uh, uh, smart grids, uh, analyzing sm the demand response, energy aware buildings, ge genetic oscillators, and what happened. Right? So that's, that's due to statistical so what is statistical modeling really doing? Well, you have your stochastic model. Uh, um, you have some way of generating runs from it. You have a property. Uh, you can think of an LTL, MITL property, or, or time-bounded property. <clears throat> so for each run, whenever you generate a run, you check whether this, this uh, run satisfies the property. If it does, then you say, OK, that's, that's, uh, that's one point to yes. Uh, and if it doesn't, then that's one point to no. Uh, and then, of course, you know that you will not be able to settle whether the, the unknown probability of a random run satisfying this uh, formula is above some threshold, you will not be able to settle that, settle that exactly, <clears throat> but maybe after some loops in this, uh, in this um, statistical modeling engine, you will have enough evidence to actually settle this yes or no with a certain level of significance. Of confidence, right? So that's just good old hypothesis testing. And you can be smart. There are techniques for doing this in a sequential manner. You don't need to pre-compute the big number of runs you need to compute. You can sort of benefit from the fact that each individual run maybe maybe um, contributes to the S here because maybe maybe this unknown probability is way above this threshold probability. So that's statistical model checking. And if you were to do this for these systems here now, viewing them as uh, stochastic uh, time perturbator. Uh, you can actually answer the, ask these questions here in the poll. So what is the probability that within five time units you get to the end? <coughs> is that greater than 0 0.2? And you will get the, the, answer, uh, the answer yes here, but with some level of confidence. And similar, if you ask the same query down here, you will actually get the answer no with some level of confidence. And you can see the number of runs that you need to actually obtain these, uh, these variables with that level of confidence. Uh, then, at some point, uh, haven't I seen this before? I actually have, because this is an extract from this probabilistic bias simulation paper uh, way back. And here, what we say is that a property, so that's a property that holds for some process and not for some other ones, is testable if for any level of significance you can find a test, an observation set, so that for any process that satisfies the property, you will have a high probability of actually getting an outcome in this, in, in this, in this, uh, in this evidence set E, 
And whenever you have a, a, a process that does not satisfy the property, you will have a low probability. If you, if you, if you can do that, uh, then you are testable. And that's precisely statistical logic, right? It's, it's, it's about testing the system that is asked for runs, and then at the end of the day come up with a verdict where you have you know, confidence that your, 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 your answer is correct up to this level of uh, significance. Right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's very nice, and this logic that you just saw, probabilistic model logic that I introduced in the beginning, is actually testable. So whatever property you write down in this logic, I can find a test, and, and for whatever delta you come with, I can find a test, and the smaller the delta, obviously, more and more complex that test will be, so that you will get the right outcome, you will make the right uh, conclusion with high probability. Uh, so what are these, uh, what are these tests? Well, actually, these tests are sort of not just single ones. You can, of course, ask for do that action, do that action, do that action, do that action, terminate. But in the middle of things, you can also ask, well, take, take some copies of the system in the current state. And for each, for each uh, copy, do that, do that test on that copy, do that test on that copy. So there is a little test where you try to do an A first, and if you're successful, then you take two copies, and one copy you try to do an A, and another copy you try to do an B. And here are all the possible outcomes that you could possibly have running that test. And here you see the distributions of these five different outcomes under these two probabilistic systems. And you can see these distributions are, are quite different. Right? Uh, and the nice result is that um, probabilistic bisimulation is nothing more than the testing endpoints. So uh, two pro uh, processes are probabilistic bisimilar. If and only if, for any test you can think of, and for any outcome, there is an agreement between P and Q as to what is the probability of seeing that outcome. Or you can also say, if I were to take the relational <coughs> distance between uh, uh, P, that should be a Q here, sorry, P and Q, over all tests and all, all, over all outcomes, then that's a zero one function. It's, it's one if they are not probabilistic by similar, and it's zero if they are probabilistic by similar. Okay. So that's... Uh, that's nice. So let me get to my maybe point where, yeah, where I think um, we need to do a little bit more parameter continuity. So this epsilon here was a parameter, right? So uh, I computed the distance, and it's nice because the distance between these two systems will obviously, you know, converge to zero when this parameter uh, in the, in the, uh, here in the, in the model, so the syntactic parameter, gets to zero. So it's like you have a family of models uh, given by this parameter. Here are two other systems. So it's, it's a coin with head and a tail. And here you see a nice fair coin. Uh, and here you see, uh, well, a slightly biased coin. And now you can compute the distance between these two, these two coins. And, uh, well, the amazing thing and the shock to me was that it doesn't really matter what this epsilon is. They're always <coughs> at dist distance one. That's not good. I don't like that. Yeah, I have to do something about that, right? It was a, it was a colleague of ours from machine intelligence that actually came up with this, with this example. I think it's well known. It, was, it has been well known. But I think we need to do something about that. In fact, thinking back, knowing that, that, this, that, the, by, that you can actually test tell completely apart things that are not probabilistic by similar by sufficient testing, in some sense, it should not be a surprise. I mean, if you have a coin and, they, and one is fair and, one, and the other is not fair, then by you know sufficiently much coin flipping, you will be able to say with high, with probability one that they are not they are, they are not the same. So I think this is um, something we have to do something about. In fact, we are in good company because this uh, variation, total variational distance, <coughs> also has this problem. So they also. Have so it's not just us. So what I suggest, but this will be a little bit too long, but I suggest that somehow we need to take the effort that you put into these distances. I mean, why is it that you think that these two things are replaceable with each other? Because you will not spend all the effort in the world and all the time in the whatever, and to infinity, to actually, you know, figure out that they are different. You want to put a bound on the effort uh, on that. And then, then the distance should sort of be parameterized with the amount of effort that you allow yourself to put into it. So, for instance, it could just be looking at the, um, if, you, if you have this coin here, the fair coin, and uh, um, these coins where, uh, of this type here, where the greater the i, the further you are away from h, then you can actually see that the distance up to level n between h and h i are actually given by various, very, very different functions. 
So for sure, uh, with the high, when i is 10, you are converging much more fast, um, much more quickly to one than, than if i is uh, free from this one. So you, <coughs> you, would, you would use that to say that h, uh, that, that uh, h3 is much closer to h than, than, than h10 right? because of this uh, speed of convergence. Uh, one, one thing that is good is that if you take the discounted version of our, our metric, it is per parameter continuous and it, is, uh, it also has this nice thing about uh, you know, having this agreement between the logical and the, and the, and the behavioral. So that's very good. I was always a little bit suspicious to this, uh, for this uh, discounted version, but in some sense it makes sense because it's saying that uh, the, 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 the things that, will, that you plan to do further down the line should, should uh, count more, uh, count less than what you're, what you're currently doing here. So you have a way sort of weighing, weighing the effort that you are doing now with what you're doing into the, into the far future. Uh, I have a number of other proposals, but I think you're waving your hand, so I'm, uh, I, we can talk about this uh, in the break perhaps, but some of them are actually having to do with uh, bounding the, the uh, so in this variational distance of, of the testing, we could think of putting a bound on the, on the size of the test that we're using to actually scrutinize the difference. That could be, uh, could be an interesting one. Uh, you could also think that maybe you have um, some, you have a um, distribution over these um, real valued functions or over the LCL properties that you use to actually compute an average. That's also a nice uh, uh, parameter continuous distance. Uh, but I think we need to more, work, work more on that. Uh, so let me stop here by, with, with uh, just saying congratulations again. So here you're you're congratulating yourself. No, you are not. You are rooting for <laughs> for Denmark when we lost uh, uh, in the European Cup uh, against uh, Portugal. What well, you cannot see in the picture is that Kim was crying in the same. Place. I was crying. <laughs> <laughs> we were still we were still a bit hopeful there, <laughs> and we have to, we had to keep us keep us away. Uh, I would say you you left some good wives. Because actually, I'm proud to tell you that Obok won the double in Denmark this year, just recently. So you should have been there one week ago. It was party all over the place. <laughs> this is this is really fantastic. It's the first time in 40 years that Obok won uh, the cup, thanks to you. <laughs> and that also won the national championship. Well, that, that we do every five or six or seven years, something like that. So congratulations from Obok. And then finally, uh, congratulations from Arne. Yeah. So so I have this nice. Uh, this is his personal OP scarf. So, uh, <laughs> I do have a question. So, now that you've pointed out the parameter continuity of the discounted distance, why is there this urgency to fix the other one? Maybe not. Maybe not. Because I mean, I think this could be, no, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm just well, trying to be a little bit provocative here, right? But I think there could be other solutions, so, and I think the key is to be aware that I mean, the reason why you think one is as good as the other one is that because you, you only use it or examine it in this new concept in a limited map, right? So I think it would be nice to put some, some, some bounds in that. But you are absolutely right, this this discounted one, perfectly fine, and of course it's also in your book, so uh, and in what, what you've all been doing so long. Sampling with my copying testing technique, I can sort of postulate this is the model, 
and then with this unknown distance, I know that the real model is no more than this epsilon distance away with this confidence. There are, there are inequalities that will represent that. Because there's variations once you're not bound. But is that for linear time properties? So what kind of properties do you preserve? Also, also branching time properties, which is what the, the, the bisimulation of distance are. I'm not sure about linear time properties. But, uh, but it's interesting. Right. It's interesting. Of course, we want to. It's precisely because we are into this statistical uh, business where we are. We, are, we don't get exactly so. What we want to benefit mm -hmm. from doing this statistical modeling, but some approximate model can still have some something sensitive. You haven't met that, but he's by a machine learning guru. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so I yeah. want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, are you? Um, no, it's not uh, Sorry. statistical one, but are you aware of my uh, definition of uh, epsilon distance to epsilon by simulation? Because it does uh, give epsilon yeah. to this uh, example. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, and it's computable in polynomial uh, time. Okay. And, uh, and it preserves properties as well? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Epsilon preserves properties. Mm -hmm. yeah.